Our next speaker is Janet M. Barth, PhD from Papacton Institute, an economic research and consultant firm, actually an economic research firm, not, not the, the faux firm that uh, commented in the yes guys. Uh, Jeanette has worked in the fields of economic analysis and economic, um, econ econometric modeling and forecasting for more than 35 years. Her former positions include Chief Economist, New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and Consultant and Account Manager for Chase Econometrics and Interactive Data Corporation. Jeanette. Very short. Thank you, Martha, and thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me? Some of you know that I have been writing and speaking about the economic impact of shale gas drilling for about three years now. I've been critiquing many of the industry-funded studies, and I've been comparing the conclusions of these studies to the conclusions of independent, unbiased research. The conclusions from the unbiased research are vastly different from the conclusions made by the industry-funded studies. I was looking forward to seeing the economic assessment done by Ecology and Environment for the revised draft SGEIS. From now on, I'm going to call Ecology and Environment E&E. &E. Um, I was hoping that this would be the study that was needed, um, a comprehensive, unbiased, and transparent economic assessment. I couldn't have been more wrong. When I read it, I was at first very disappointed and saddened, and then I became appalled. I had to look at the cover again to be sure that I had not accidentally picked up one of the industry-funded studies that I had been critiquing. e, e has ignored significant economic costs, and it has exaggerated economic benefits, including employment, income, and tax revenue. Exaggerating tax revenue is particularly concerning for the future of New York State finances in light of the fact that the budget process may be relying on the estimates out of this report. I'm going to summarize a few of the flaws, omissions, and exaggerations in the economic assessment done by E&E. &E. A thorough research effort normally begins with a review of the relevant literature, yet it is clear from the list of references in Section 5 that a literature review was not conducted. There is extensive independent and academic literature that has been written and published on the subject of economic impact of extractive industries, and these research findings have been ignored. I do wonder if they ignored this research because the unbiased research concludes that areas with extractive industries end up worse off in the long run economically. If any of you want me to, to direct you to some of this literature, please email me. I'll be giving you my email at the end. A major concern that has been voiced repeatedly over the past several years is the likelihood that various existing industries that are vital to the region may, um, may be negatively impacted. Um, such industries include organic farming, tourism, hunting, fishing, winemaking, and river and lake recreation. This concern was not treated seriously in the economic assessment. The assessment report itself states that agriculture and tourism are important industries in all three of the regions studied in the assessment, yet the potential costs associated with declines in these industries are not properly addressed. The impacts on agriculture that are mentioned in the assessment report are the increased cost of land as a factor of production and the fact that some land will be taken out of production, but no estimate is made. Major food co-ops have stated that they will not buy our produce uh, from areas that have hydro hydraulic fracturing. And they'll also be a high cost if our agricultural lands and nearby water become contaminated, contaminated with toxic or radioactive substances. Why was the potential negative impact to agriculture of water and land contamination risk ignored? Why were the major purchases of our agricultural products not interviewed and surveyed on whether or not they would continue to purchase our produce? Potential negative impacts on the tourism industry were dismissed by simply stating that two counties, Cattaraugus and Chautauqua, with a history of vertical gas drilling in New York State, have a strong tourism industry. This is not a thorough analysis. The assessment report itself indicates that the Catskill Mountains and the Finger Lakes are two of New York State's most important tourist regions. These regions and others should all be carefully evaluated for the potential negative impacts. 
increasing second home ownership is very important to these areas as well, and the impact on that trend should be studied. That's ignored in the assessment. Not only are there various ways to attempt to evaluate the negative impacts due to potential declines in other industries, there are also existing studies that E&E &E could have referenced. For example, one study calculated that the net present value using a discount rate of 3% over 100 years of natural goods and services from ecosystems in the New York State portion of the Delaware River Basin is $113.6 billion. That's $113.6 billion in only the New York State portion of the Delaware River Basin. Such estimates should be done for all industries that could be negatively impacted in the entire New York State portion of the Marcella Shale region. And the probability and extent of these declines should also be evaluated. It is both shocking and suspect that E&E &E did not reference or consider the results of relevant existing studies. There have been many concerns voiced over the past several years about the cost to communities, but there was no attempt to estimate such costs. Costs associated with the increased demand for community social services, police and fire departments, first responders, and local hospitals should all be estimated, not simply mentioned and then ignored. The final paragraph of the assessment report simply lists a few of these costs, but there's no effort to estimate any of these costs. It's possible to estimate potential truck traffic and the related wear and tear on roads, and these costs are not all paid for by the gas industry, as is evidenced by the experience in Arkansas, where they got stuck with, the taxpayers got stuck with the bill of road repair. And as we've just heard, there was a leaked memo from the New York State DOT, which actually estimated the cost associated with road damage in New York State, and that was all ignored, not even mentioned in the assessment. There was no attempt to measure public health costs. Multiple respected scientists and physicians have been raising health concerns for years. These costs may be very, very high, but they were ignored. It's well known that extractive industries create a boom and bust cycle for communities, but the costs of a long-term bust are not reflected in the assessment. The report summarized some research findings on the potential impact on property values, but there was no mention of the reports that banks may not issue mortgages on properties with or near a gas well. And there was also no mention of the evidence in Texas, in Wise County, where the appraisal district uh, de decreases the values of homes by 75% if it has a well on the property. That's a big drop in property values. And remember that declines in property values end up with declines in real estate tax revenues. Another important economic impact on the region that is completely ignored in the economic assessment is the loss of future economic development potential after a spider web of pipelines are built, preventing future building on or near these pipelines. This may be a very significant cost to the region going forward. I feel that a thorough economic assessment should include detailed recommendations regarding action steps to help maximize benefits and minimize costs. Such recommendations are not made in this assessment. The pace and scale of drilling can significantly affect long-term impacts, and the various alternatives regarding pace and scale should be carefully analyzed. Tax policy recommendations and financial assurance recommendations should be made to be sure that funding is available to communities for their increased costs and also for environmental mitigation. A long-term Detailed economic development plan for the entire region must be in place that would help to minimize the negative impacts of a potential economic bust. I've given just a few examples here of the areas for which an economic assessment should provide recommendations. So far, I have focused on the many costs that have been omitted from the assessment. Let me turn to the assessment of benefits. E&E &E has exaggerated the benefits, including employment growth, income growth, population growth, and tax revenue. All of these factors are dependent on the assumptions made regarding natural gas production. If production assumptions are exaggerated, then employment, income, population, and tax revenue growth will also all be exaggerated. It appears that the assumptions regarding both the amount of recoverable shale gas and the production amounts are exaggerated. I know that Chip is going to be speaking in more detail about those exaggerated production numbers, so I'll, I'll leave that to him. But the fact is that um, if you have an economic model and you plug in exaggerated production numbers, it's pretty obvious that exaggerated employment, income, tax revenue are going to come out the other end. Um, 
Also, E&E has made unsupported assumptions about transient workers. The report states that 77% of the Marcellus workforce in year one would be transient, and that by year 30, 90% of all workers would be hired locally. They don't clearly explain the basis for these assumptions. E&E makes the transient worker assumption for the purpose of estimating changes in population. So therefore, the population projections appear to be based on a weak underlying analysis. A more important flaw is the fact that E&E does not appear to adjust the income projections for transient workforces. It's obvious that a transient workforce will not be spending all of their money in the region. They send most of their money home to their families in their home states, where it helps to improve those economies. There are also some technical problems with the assessment. E and E used what they call RIMS2 multipliers. This is the regional input-output modeling system of the Euros, US Bureau of Economic Analysis. The input-output modeling, also called IO modeling, is very useful in many, many situations. I've used it myself. But in this instance, it's lacking for a number of reasons. First, it doesn't capture the cost of environmental degradation, damage and wear and tear on roads, health effects and pollution, and negative impacts on other industries, as I've discussed before. Input-output models assume that all populations have identical spending patterns. This exaggerates economic impact if new workers are transient, sending their wages to other regions. There are several other technical re reasons why the I.O. technique is not appropriate in this case as a standalone technique. And if you're interested in those technical details, email me and we can talk about that. But the, the limitations of this approach and this methodology um, are not sufficiently explained in this E&E &E assessment and in any economic report should explain the limitations of the approach that they're using. Another area where the E&E assessment is deficient is in its assumption of full-time equivalent workers. They take their numbers directly from Pennsylvania's Marcellus Shale Education and Training Center. All assumptions, including this one, should be verified by looking at data from other shale plays and multiple sources. E&E assumes 11.3 full-time equivalent workers per well during the construction phase and 0.17 full-time equivalent workers to operate the well. They adjust the 11.3 downward for vertical wells, but I've seen other estimates. For example, there's at least one researcher who has estimated that only one full-time equivalent job is created during the drilling and development phase. The lack of thoroughness in checking assumptions, whether it regards full-time equivalent workers, gas reserve estimates, or years of production is a major flaw in the economic assessment. Here are a few additional relevant facts that are not addressed in the economic assessment. The oil and gas industry is 10 times more capital intensive than the average American industry. Capital, capital intensive industri industries are not major job creators. It would be far better for our economy, and in particular for job creation, to encourage a more labor intensive industry in the area. Also, job creation from investment in renewable forms of energy appears to be much greater than job creation from investment in fossil fuels. Here are some estimates out of UMass, Department of Economic and Policy Research. They show that the number of jobs created for every million dollars of expenditure on oil and gas production is only 3.7 jobs, while between 9.5 and 12.4 jobs are created for every $1 million spent on producing renewables. The economic assessment done by E&E &E for the revised draft SGEIS is inaccurate, misleading, and unacceptable. We must insist on a comprehensive, unbiased, peer-reviewed economic impact analysis based on published data and appropriate models that everyone can respect. All costs and benefits must be taken into account as accurately as possible. Only then will our leaders be able to make informed decisions. You may be interested to know about a study, maybe some of you have, have seen it, on the economic impact of the proposed Keystone XL pipeline that was recently released. It was done by a group of researchers at Cornell, and it criticizes the industry-funded studies of the economic impact of the pipeline. 
And the criticisms that are in the report are very similar to all of the criticisms that I have been making for several years on the industry-funded studies of gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale. So it appears that the oil and gas industry regularly tries to mislead the public. Here's my email. I'd love to chat with any of you more about all of this. And that was my portion that was the portion of my talk on economics. I want to just add one more slide on popular opinion because I don't know how many of you are aware of some recent poll results. Pulse Opinion Research recently conducted telephone polls for Sullivan County and for Delaware County. They're both in the Catskills. In response to the question, do you support natural gas extraction by means of hydraulic fracturing in your town, 69% of respondents in Sullivan County were opposed, compared to only 27% in support. In Delaware County, it was 72% opposed, compared to only 26% in support. And these results are consistent with the recent local polls that have been done, such as the town of Meredith, where 77% were opposed, the town of Milford, where 91% were opposed, and the town of Hartwick, where 82% are opposed. I wonder what's happening in Albany. Thank you. That's a lot to absorb. Thank you so much, Jeanette. It's especially disturbing to hear these things since the economic benefits are supposed to be the reason that New York would do this and especially disturbing because just in the last two days I've heard two great reports from NPR about all the job benefits of, of gas drilling around the country. So given those, the, pop, the, the surveys, it's interesting because as we know, you can't turn on the radio or television without seeing a, an advertisement from a natural gas uh, a company, especially I was in Lake Placid for a conference last month, Lake Placid, nowhere near, I don't think even the Utica Shale. Why were they advertising in the Lake Placid media market by the gas companies? Just a, just a word on the, the health impacts, because we don't have a speaker specifically talking about the lack of a health assessment uh, or any mitigation measures in the, in the new document. It, for, to me, it sort of reads like one of those commercials for um, you know, the latest new drug, how uh, it's, you know, this, the purple pill is, is going to be wonderful, wonderful for you. Your health is going to be terrific. Your life is going to be renewed. Then very quickly they go through the side effects, itching, rash, diarrhea, dizzy, head pain, feel like throwing up, uh, depression, cataracts, ulcerated colon, gallstones, you know, potential suicide or death, fever, pain, chills, and, and gas. So... Other than that, it's really healthy, so.